NASCAR rule. I mean, yeah, NASCAR does rule. They also have rules, and that's a fact of life. Without them, we'd just be living in anarchy, and well, take it from me, anarchy ain't all it's cracked up to be. Real life isn't always fair or fun, but NASCAR races try to be both. So if you poke around on the interwebs, you can find the guidelines for NASCAR Cup Car Livery, sponsorship, qualifying, point scoring, pit road rules, race procedures, and penalties. Man, that is a lot of rules, but what about rules for the cup cars themselves? NASCAR keeps those locked up behind a username and password, and some seasons, you might have new adjustments to the rule books every race. Why all them dang nab rules? Yeah! This might be hard to believe, but in the beginning, stock car racing was actually racing stock cars. Yeah, it's the National Association for Stock Car Auto Racing. The first official NASCAR strictly stock division race was held in June 19, 1949 at the Charlotte Speedway in North Carolina. Racers had to complete 200 laps on a three quarter mile dirt oval in completely stock production cars. Top speed was barely 68 miles an hour. But racing a normal car isn't that exciting and NASCAR's roots are in bootlegging, which involved a lot of tinkering and souping up of cars. Did somebody say soup? Oh, hey Campbell, what are you doing here? This isn't a cooking show, this is a car channel. You know where the term souped up comes from? Gosh, no. I actually never thought about where the term souped up comes from. It comes from back in the days of horse raising. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Guys used to give their horse amphetamines to make him run faster, and they'd mix it in with the soup. So they'd say, hey, that horse must be souped up. Ah, thanks, Campbell. OK, I'm going to go cool off. That's some pretty interesting information. Eventually, NASCAR enforced a homologation rule that required manufacturers to sell a certain number of the model that they wanted to race to the public. That led to the production of a few unique models specifically for NASCAR races. Instead of taking regular cars and modifying them for racing, Ford and Chrysler just went ahead and made straight up race cars with extreme aerodynamic features and tried to sell them to people. The Ford Torino Talladega had a rounded nose and the Dodge Charger Daytona and Plymouth Superbird had super tall rear wings and pointed nose caps. Those special aero NASCAR models, they were making all kinds of downforce and obliterating the other cars on the race circuit. So in 1971, NASCAR rewrote the rules and introduced the restrictor plate for the first time. A restrictor plate's a thin piece of metal with some holes in it installed into the car's intake. It reduces the amount of air and fuel that reaches the cylinders. Less air and fuel means less boom, slower acceleration, and a lower top speed. We still use restrictor plates in NASCAR, though these cars can still get well above 700 horsepowers. All right, now think about this. Imagine it's 1971 and you're taking your brand new Hemi Cuda to the oval and flooring it. Awesome! Now imagine getting in a wreck. Unsafe at any speed? How safe at 180 miles an hour? Not safe. So it's becoming even more clear that more modifications should be made to these cars. Stock cars are getting less and less stock, but for the right reasons, both speed and safety. NASCAR is and almost always has been a clash between rules that try to keep drivers safe while creating a level playing field and teams trying to exploit loopholes in those rules to gain an advantage. Recently, NASCAR decided to regulate which impact wrenches could be used in the pits. Then, the crew figured out that if they changed the gas, they could get the guns to go faster, be more powerful, so then NASCAR had to make a rule for that. Pretty sneaky, guys. And seeing it on TV, those cars look cool. You have no idea how fast 200 miles an hour is until you see these cars hurtling around the track in person. And you got no idea what it's like to drive one of these things until you get to. Why put on the restrictor plates? Isn't faster better? I don't know. Let's ask professional NASCAR driver Parker Kligerman. The intention of the new rules package is, okay, what if we started to give these cars more grip 
gave them a little less horsepower and allow us to kind of race each other instead of just racing ourselves, racing the track. Modern day rule changes are tested in computer simulations, wind tunnels, and field tests, but there's no way to account for every possible factor at every track. In addition to the large number of things that can be changed on the car, track surfaces change over time, the weather changes all the time, and the drivers themselves are completely unpredictable. You don't know what the guy next to you is going to do. NASCAR uses science to inform their decisions about the rules, but often a new rule is really a scientific experiment in itself. And sometimes things don't always work out like you hope. The latest cup cars came out in 2013 and they're called Generation 6. Since the car shapes had become super uniform, they adjusted the rules to let the cars more closely resemble the production models upon which they're based. It's the only Camry in the world with a V8, right? Rear-wheel drive V8. Rear-wheel drive V8 Camry. And remember, the idea is trying to keep the cars similar, but allowing enough room for adjustment. Here's a quick rundown of the specs. Every car's got a front engine, rear-wheel drive layout in a tube frame chassis. The whole thing is basically a roll cage. They're closed wheel, closed cockpit race cars with a 24 gauge sheet metal body panel. The suspension rules call for an independent front double wishbone setup and a solid axle with trailing arms in the rear. That means the rear suspension is dependent, kind of like a 21 year old living at home. The brake rotors have to be magnetic, cast iron, or steel and can't have a larger diameter than 12.72 inches. Anti-lock brakes and traction control systems are strictly not allowed. But even with all of those regulations, there's still room for teams to change subtle things that will affect their car's performance. We're here with Parker Kligerman, and we've been told he is the absolute authority as far as drivers go on what all the new rules are. It starts pretty much at the engine, right? Horsepower is always key. These are 900 horsepower engines that are now restricted down to about 750. We're all roughly close because of the way they restrict the engines, but from there they become erector sets, these race mm -hmm. cars. So it's all about downforce and side force. In stock cars, the other thing we fight besides aero is heat. We constantly try to take heat out of the tires, out of the engine, out of the brakes. Mm -hmm. Heat sap speed. Next year, we are going to be having the same engines. They're just going to be restricted now all the way down to 550 horsepower. We're going to put a massive spoiler on the back. It's so big, we actually put like clear plexiglass at the top so that we can see through it, through the, the <laughs> mirror. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to see out the back. We're going to enlarge the splitter, and then we have these aero ducts where we now have brake ducts that mm -hmm. are going to allow the air to basically come through the front wheel wells. These ducts right now that run through here can come out into the tire. They'll now be forced out right here, and the air will be forced out, and that will create drag on the cars to slow us down. Well, let's talk about aero. The use of aerodynamic devices is limited to a front splitter, side skirts, rear spoiler, and NACA ducts in the window. The NACA ducts are low drag air inlet. Why do they call it a NACA duck? I'll tell you. It was originally created by the U.S. National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NACA. Oh, this is pretty cool. There's also flaps integrated into the roof and the hood. So if the car goes into a spin, they pop up, keep the car down. And none of the other aero components can be adjusted or tuned. But that doesn't stop teams from trying to tweak them to gain advantages anyway. For example, at Chicagoland Speedway in September 2017, Hendrick Motorsports stuck a bit of tape to the top edge of Chase Elliott's rear spoiler. At 200 miles an hour, that little bit of tape could have added somewhere between 30 and 50 pounds of downforce, which could give him a 0.2 second advantage in lap times. Elliott came in second. And then after the official findings, he and the team were penalized for breaking the rules. But that's what I'm talking about. The slightest edge can make a big difference. Oh, let's talk about some of the mind-boggling tech that goes into making sure these teams are following the rules. We're inside the optical scan station here optical at NASCAR. Scan. So what the camera is doing is projecting different patterns on the car. It takes all that photogrammetry and it compares it to the CAD of the car. As each one of the patterns is going across the body of the car, is snapping pictures at all the time. Specter will come in and he'll turn the wheel. So as he's turning the wheel, it's taking measurements. Wheelbase, tread width, toe, camber, everything. Let's go outside, he's gonna show us the results. So it takes all that data and it dumps it into a results folder. Green is good. Uh, anything red is coming at you. Anything blue is going away from you. If I saw this quarter panel and there was a lot of blue, that's an arrow advantage. So I would look at that and say, hey, you gotta fix that. When I talk about wheel alignments on the inside, this is what it gives us. Amber, tread, taste, tells us which way they skew the rear end, whether they got a forward or rearward. If something is off, we gotta fix it. Yes. Or, and that gets measured again tomorrow before the race. 
That's pretty cool stuff. And these guys know what they're doing. But the cars don't always keep that shape. So these doors will cave in. Mm -hmm. This down here will try and cave in. You'll try to flare the skirts. This will all cave in. And then when we get off the racetrack, it all has to pop back into shape. We want to try and steal downforce, steal side force, steal speed. So then we start to make these cars change and move. It's like, the, it's like bootleggers. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're still the same guys. We're still running moonshine. Hey, now let's talk about these dang old power plants that sound so good. The engines are electronically fuel injected iron block V8s with valves operated by push rods and you got two valves per cylinder. Engine size capped at 358 cubic inches or 5.8 liters and they can make somewhere around 850 horsepower. At most racetracks the engines run at over 9,000 RPM, more than 500 miles. If you tried to do that with your car, you'd probably need a new car. For 36 races, including season and non-points exhibition races, you get 13 engines. You gotta use each of them twice for two entire race weekends, and they get sealed up to make sure you're not cheating. And the engine also has to be the same one used in qualifying. If you swap out the motor, the car and the driver lose their qualifying position, you start at the back of the grid. Oh, this is pretty cool too. Other strictly mandated equipment includes the tires. Every team uses the exact same tires developed exclusively by Goodyear. The rubber compounds made to balance grip, heat, and tire wear characteristics. Goodyear selects drivers every weekend to give them feedback on how the cars and tires are feeling for the track. Every driver is running on the same tires as every other driver. Remember when I said they're trying to keep things even? And although the tires can't be changed, futzing with the air pressure is allowed and that can have a big effect on handling. You'll see pit crews inflating or deflating tires during the race based on feedback that they're getting from the drivers. Also, the camber on these things is nuts. In oval tracks, both tires are cambered the same way to hug those turns. During cornering, the right front tire supports a load of some 4,000 pounds, just like your mom's chair. So making sure things are properly adjusted is crucial. If that doesn't sound advanced enough for you, we've also got people upstairs in the pit monitoring the path of the car and the forces on it in real time comparing it to previous laps. Oh, and you may have heard a little to do about the upcoming 2019 NASCAR Cup Series season rules. For some tracks, it's going to need a lower top speed, but it's going to need a lot more downforce. Why do they do this? I don't know. Let's ask professional NASCAR driver Bubba Wallace. It just closes up the gap from 20th on back. That's what we're hoping for. We could have a majority of the field close together and racing and trying to do whatever they can to get to the lead. We're still probably going to battle the dirty air is what we call it. You get within three or four car lengths of another car and you kind of stall out. Going into three for the lead. We got a ton more, pretty much a thousand pounds more downforce added at some tracks, not all the tracks. Different spoiler on the back, so I'll say I'm excited about it just to try it out. It's, uh, it's going to be interesting. The rear spoiler is going to be 8 inches tall by 61 inches wide, which is taller than what they're currently running. This means more downforce, which can give cars better grip in trickier situations. The splitter is going to be larger too, with a 2 inch overhang and 10 and a half inch winglets on the ends under the car. The radiator pan is going to be wider, measuring 37 inches in the front, tapering to 31 in the back. These three aerodynamic changes are going to increase overall downforce and they're going to be used at all the 2019 races. And this stuff's pretty interesting too. At oval tracks larger than a mile, cars are going to use aero ducts in the front bumper to divert air off the side of the car and away from the front tires. So it would yep. be an actual duct. Right here. No longer a sticker. Mm -hmm. That's to reduce the amount of turbulence in the car's wake, so it's going to be easier for a trailing competitor to pass. And then for racing at hard braking tracks like Atlanta, and Darlington, Pocono, and Homestead, cars are going to switch to brake ducts. Now, let's get back to this infamous restrictor plate. <laughs> 2019, only the Daytona 500 is going to be run with a true restrictor plate. At all the other tracks, teams are going to use two different sizes of tapered spacers. So what's the difference? A restrictor plate is just an eighth of an inch thick aluminum plate with four holes in it. Why change to a tapered spacer? Why are you asking me all these questions? You know I'm going to answer them. When the air runs into the restrictor plate, the molecule's got to make a harsh 90 degree turn to get through the hole. The restricted turbulent airflow reduces the engine's output significantly, somewhere in the 400 horse 
first power range. If you get someone with sandpaper on their finger and scratch the plate, you're gonna gain like a half a second. Just makes it a little bit harder to enforce that everybody's following the rules. Tapered spacers eliminate that quality control problem. They're also aluminum plates with four holes in them, only these plates are about an inch thick. The holes are tapered at seven degrees on the intake side so that air flows through more smoothly. Seven degrees is the maximum angle air can travel along a surface without separating from it, which helps to reduce the turbulence. That taper effectively turns each hole into a nozzle. The smaller tapered spacer should knock horsepower down to about 550, while the larger spacer limits horsepower at about 725. So they tested these rules in both the lab and at a few 2018 events before they wrote them into 2019 official rules. And when they tried them out, the increased downforce and lower top speed seemed to have created a more exciting pack racing dynamic. But what do the drivers think? We're all cautiously optimistic, I would say, you know, to see what it brings. Like we've had a couple tests where we've seen some cool passing and such, but uh, there's, a, there's an LME that wants 1,000 horsepower and no, no downforce <laughs> whatsoever. You know, uh -huh. that's what I want to drive. Uh -huh. That's what any driver wants to drive. Yeah. But it might not be realistic for a show. NASCAR is as much about the fans as it is the drivers. You try things, see if they work, and if they don't, you make changes. That's how progress is made. And it's what's kept NASCAR on the cutting edge of racing technology. Uh, that's Ooh, I like it, man. That. That's, that's NASCAR. Yeah, welcome. That was comprehensive. It's NASCAR week on Donut. The last race of 2018 is this Sunday at Homestead, Miami. You don't want to miss it. It all comes down to this. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this episode. I know you like learning. And if you like learning, you'll love Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes in design, business, technology, and more. You want to know how we did this? Sport, I was trying! Then you can learn video editing with Premiere Pro, with Jordy Vandeput, along with 6,500 others. Premium membership gives you unlimited access to high quality classes on must know topics. So you can improve your skills, unlock new opportunities, and do the work that you love. Skillshare is also more affordable than most learning platforms out there. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. I've got that right here in my pants. And what's even better is that the first thousand people to sign up with the link in the description get the first two months for free. So go to skl.sh slash science garage four or click on the link in the description. Go get skilled. Skillshare. Subscribe to Donut. You can click this button. You can click that subscribe button. Learn more about aerodynamics by watching this video. And you can learn even more about aerodynamics by watching this other video. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Donut Media. You can follow me at BidsBardo. Get some Donut merch at shop.donut.media. Don't tell my wife I'm building a stock car.